Okay, let's uh, let's get together. Good morning, everybody. I need my Bible. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to North State Community Church on a beautiful Sunday morning. It's great to see you guys this morning. Uh, I think everybody, I, I, if, if you're visiting the, for the first time, there are bathrooms right through that gray door. So there's that. I'm going to ask if uh, Becky will join me up here. We are, as we get started this morning, uh, we are entering what's called the season of Lent. 
Now, many of you, maybe, you know, you haven't uh, done that before. If you come from certain church backgrounds, you do the Lenten season. But actually, Lent is, so Becky and I are going to explain it to you, because, you know, uh, again, some people don't know what it is, why they do it, or they just associate it, like, with the Catholic Church or certain high church Protestants or whatever. Um, but uh, Christians were celebrating Lent before they celebrated Christmas. The early church used to celebrate it. Uh, it's basically, it's a 40-day period that leads right up to Easter, okay? And it's a time where we take inventory of our lives, uh, draw close to God, and really clear out things that, what it's, this is why people like, if you've heard of Lent, probably the only thing you know about it is that people, you know, drop something for 40 days, you know, they fast from something or whatever. The idea of that is, and we're going to you know, go a little deeper than that this morning on it, is that you um, are sort of clearing out distractions in your life to, in order to focus in on God. Uh, there's a great story in the Bible that, uh, it's not about Lent, but it kind of gives you a nice picture of that. There's an Old Testament story in Second Chronicles 15. It's the story of King Asa. And if you read the Old Testament with the kings, it's always up and down and up and down, and the people go off and they worship idols and all this. And so this king gets confronted by a prophet who tells them, seek the Lord over and over again. You need to seek the Lord. And here's what, I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's not like just wander around and God's going to show up somewhere. It's a, no, you need to be intentional and you need to seek after God and he will be found by you. And the question is, what does that look like? And so thinking of Lent, what is it? I can just say, well, seek the Lord in the next 40 days. Well, the way Asa responded, it says this in, in Chronicles. When Asa heard these words and the prophecy of Azariah, the prophet, he took courage. He removed the idols from the whole land of Judah and Benjamin, and then he repaired the altar of the Lord that was in front of the Lord's temple. So there's two things he did. He did a subtraction and he did an addition. If you want to think of it very simply, if you want to think of Lent, just think subtraction, addition. And so he subtracted or he removed the idols in the land. He removed the stuff, that, that the obstacles, the things that distract us, the things that take us away from our devotion to God. It was like spring cleaning. Just think, spring cleaning. <laughs> he, he, he removed the things that stood between himself and God and between the people and God. And then think addition. So he didn't just clear out the stuff that, that gets in the way. He rebuilt the, the temple, or sorry, the um, altar that stood before the temple. And the temple, of course, is the place where the people connected with God. And so he got, a, got rid of the distractions, and then he rebuilt, um, he, he, he made a way for people to reconnect with God. So keep that in your mind, subtraction, addition, and then Becky's going to give us more specifics about some ideas of the subtractions and the additions. When Caleb and I were first married, we were serving at a church in Washington State, and our church decided to practice Lent. And we had never practiced this before, even though, like Dave said, it's an ancient church practice. And so I just knew, oh, you got to take something away. So I had this like conviction in my heart that I wasn't spending a lot of time reading the Bible. And I was, every morning, we'd get up and Caleb would go off to work and I'd sit down at the table with my coffee and my breakfast and read the newspaper for as long as I wanted before I went on to the next thing. And so I thought, ah, I'll get rid of reading the newspaper. I'll do that for Lent. That'll be great. Then I won't read the newspaper more than I'm reading the Bible. And I did it and it was easy. I just didn't read the newspaper for a month. But I did not read the Bible more. I didn't add that practice in. And so cutting something out without adding in something formative was useless to me in a spiritual sense. It was just a thing I did that had no meaning or value in my life. The following year, our church did it again. And I spent some time asking the Lord, like, where, what do you want me to do in this season of Lent, 40 days leading up to Easter? Um, and I was asking the Lord, like, what, what can be useful and beneficial and fill me in a different way than I experienced the year before. And I felt like the Lord, strangely, said, like, stop singing harmony. And I was like, that's weird. <laughs> what? Who get, what? That's not a problem. That's not an issue. It felt strange to me, which is part of my 
like barometer for is the Lord speaking to me if I'm like that's weird I've never thought of anything like that before it might be the Lord because it's not me because it was weird but this strange thing happened for the month or a month and a half of Lent every time we'd be at church singing I would start singing harmony because that's just what I do it's just fun and I'd catch myself and I would stop and suddenly I was engaging with the lyrics like in a way that I had it for a long time because I wasn't thinking about what notes I was singing or thinking, ooh, that sounded really pretty, which is a terrible way to worship God. It's not good. So it was a hugely formative takeaway, get rid of singing harmony and like thinking about that. But it also added in this depth of worship that was actually hearing and speaking and singing the words that are glorifying God. And it was incredibly valuable. So as we come into this time, let officially starts on Wednesday. Um, the Catholic Church and other traditions practice it as Ash Wednesday and it leads up to Easter. But I want to encourage you to spend some time asking the Lord, do you want me to do something in this season leading up to Easter? What do you want me to take out of my life so that you can fill me? What do you want me to put aside and what do you want me to put into my life? So in the back on the counter next to where like the questions are, right, there's a sheet do we have the sheet with the practices? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> we'll email them to you. I forgot to check on that first. We have a sheet. So on the questions at the bottom, there have been spiritual disciplines at the bottom each week of um, prayer being one, scripture reading being one, confession, different practices that we can integrate into our lives. And we have a list of a lot of them together. So we'll get, make sure you get that where you can look it over and see where, which of these areas am I weak in? Which of these areas does God want to grow me in? Um, but ask a God. Maybe he'll bring something really weird to your mind, like not singing harmony for a month and a half. But I thought about it like every day. I'd have the radio on in the car, and I'm like, oh, no, here it is again. And I would think to pray. It just reminded me constantly that God is walking with us. So... Um, this is a new practice for a lot of us. So as we do it, talk with each other about what the Lord is doing. If you have questions, we'd love to talk to you about it. But as we go into our time of worship, I'm also going to read from Romans 11, this doxology that leads up to Romans 12 that we studied in the month of January. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. And then it goes into, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, this is your spiritual act of worship. Good morning. Uh, feel free to stand or sit uh, as we sing together whatever's, whatever's comfortable for you. Righteousness 
scorned by the ones he came to save. Till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ I live. There in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me, for I am His and He is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand. For he returns or calls me home here in the power of Christ I'll stand till he returns or calls me home here in the power of Christ I'll stand all right so this next one um we got introduced to this one. It's kind of a newer one when we were up in paradise under the trees and everything, but it's been a while. So um, it's called God is Love. And uh, if you want to just go to like the chorus slide. Mm -hmm. The chorus goes like Because he is good. He is God. What I earned is not what I got. He is just, yet oh so kind. What I deserve is not what I find. What more could I say about it? My God is love. So it's a pretty simple chorus, and I, you might catch up with the verses too, um, or just reflect on the lyrics there. They're pretty cool. How great this love. Oh, it's moving all my mountains. This perfect love is casting out my fear. How great this love. Oh, it welcomes me like family. And anywhere I go, it meets me there. Cause he is good, and he is God, and what I earn is not what I got. But he is just, yet oh so kind, what I deserve, it's not what I find. What more could I say about it? My God is love. How great this love. 
Oh, it's faithful through my failures. This trusted love is with me till the end. How great this love. Oh, it's closer than a brother. But this is love. He died so I could live. Cause he is good. He is God. And what I earn is not what I got. He is just, yet oh so kind. What I deserve is not what I find. What more could I say about it? My God is love. Good to see everybody. It's really good to be back after being away for uh, a short week there. We were out in Nashville and got to have a good time out there and see how people live out there. It's much more country than I'm used to. Not that that's a bad thing. It's just kind of threw me off, like felt out of place in Nikes when everybody else is in boots. <laughs> Today we're going to be finishing uh, the rest of Philippians chapter 2. Um, there is a part that we're actually going to be skipping over today, so I just want to tell you what that is and why we're not covering it. Um, there's this section where Paul is talking about Timothy, and I hope I don't butcher his name, but Epaphroditus. Um, basically, he's talking about kind of where they're at and what they're doing during this time as he's talking to the Philippian church. And while it's good and there's some encouraging stuff in there, we're going to focus more just on verses 12 to 18. So if you want to read that account for Timothy and Epaphroditus later, you can do that. It's pretty cool. An interesting thing about it is... For a while, biblical scholars actually debated if that was in the wrong place in the book of Philippians. When the original letters were being studied and, and kind of put back together, um, they actually debated whether or not they were even supposed to be in that section. 
Um, because they kind of feel out of place. It's just this random account of what they're doing in the middle of this train of thought that Paul's in. Ultimately, they decided that's where it goes, so that's why it's in that section. But a little Bible trivia for you today. So we're in verses 12 to 18. Now, this is a difficult passage for a lot of people. There's a lot packed into it, which is why I'm just camping out in there. And it seems almost to more than once contradict itself, which is why I want to take my time kind of going through it, because what we'll actually find is that it's not contradicting itself, but it's giving you a clear picture of what Christian life is. What I actually think Paul is trying to do here is, in as few words as possible, explain what it is to be a Christian. So your application for today, if you walk with anything, walk away with anything, is I hope that you have a clear understanding of what this Christian life is even about. What, it, what does it mean to call myself a Christian and live that way? And it's just a few verses, like I said. So we're going to pick up in verse 12. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Now there's two big things going on here, and I want to make sure we look at them both clearly to understand how they work together. So the first thing is work out your salvation, which he then immediately follows up with, for it is God who is at work in you. Again, it sounds like he's making two completely different ideas, but he's putting them right next to each other for a reason. Now, there's two wrong ways to look at this that I want to address first. There are some people who look just at the first part where it says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, and that's where you end up with a works-based kind of belief, where everything about being a Christian is about what you're doing, about what you're working, earning God's favor, earning his pleasure, how good of a Christian you can be. That's like your whole focus. And a lot of people just camp out on that. Now that doesn't make sense because he immediately follows it up with, for it's God who's at work within you. So if your mentality this morning around being a Christian is just about doing all the right things, making sure you're the best possible Christian you can be, I'm sorry, but the Bible doesn't support that. Now the other incorrect extreme is the people who would look just at the second part of that verse. who would say, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. That is a person who might say, I'm a believer, I'm saved, I believe in Jesus, so I'm just going gonna, gonna to show up to church and that's what I'm supposed to do and I'm going to live my life how I want. Again, you can't take away the first part of that word, verse, which is work out your salvation with fear and trembling. So simultaneously, there's something we're supposed to be working at and understanding that it is completely not us at the same time. So if you hold either one of those views, it's not supported by what Paul is saying here. Now, reality is that we are called to a purpose. You might remember a while back when we were in the Romans 12 series that I talked about our purpose being very individual and specific to you. There's also an overall purpose for all believers to live into. So it is very specific to you, but then there are also elements of that that are for all of us. And that's what Paul is getting at here. To work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God at work within you. Some of the best ways I can describe that, like when I became a husband. I didn't do anything other than show up and I became a husband that day, but then I'm also supposed to be a husband after that. Like if I had just showed up to my wedding, said I do, and then never talked to Megan again, I'm not being a husband. I showed up to a wedding, right? There's actually things I'm supposed to work out and live into as I'm learning to be a husband. Or there's people that I have talked to who have become a mother or a father recently, and it's simultaneously the most exciting thing in the world and the most terrifying thing in the world at the same time. That you're being handed this human life to be responsible for, to take care of, to raise, but you have to actually spend the time with the child and raise it. And there's active involvement on your part, but it's God who is creating the life. There's also elements of what is being a child in this. I think of growing up, 
that I didn't do anything to earn the name Klein as my last name. I was just born with that. I was born to my parents. But then there's also expectations of how I'm supposed to live as a part of my family. One of my dad's good friends was actually a police officer in Paradise for a long time, so I kind of had in the back of my head of like, yeah, I'm driving around Paradise. If I get a speeding ticket or something, like my dad's probably going to hear about it before I even get home. <laughs> like, there, there's a little bit of pressure there. Like, okay, like that one time I ran that stop sign, I was in a complete panic for the entire day. <laughs> so even though I didn't do anything to earn the name Klein, it was given to me. I then had to live as my father's child with everything that comes with that. So to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work it within you, it's not a contradiction, but it's Paul describing what God is doing and calling you to be his child. You didn't earn that. God loved you and made it possible for you to be his child. He initiated it. He called you. And so you get to live into that calling. You get to live as his child because he made you his child. So it's not something earned, but something lived into. You were not just saved from sin, but you were saved for a purpose. And both are true at the same time, and you can't separate them. The second thing going on in that verse, so we have work out your salvation, right? Then we have fear and trembling. Now I want to ask everybody in this room an honest question right now, and just be honest with yourself. When you think of God or picture God or if you were to de describe God, think about how you would describe him. I've talked to a few different people and a lot of the same kind of trends come up that you might recognize, you know, very loving, a father, a friend, caretaker. Those are the ideas of God that we like to focus on and they're very true. I'm not trying to say they're untrue, right? Those are very real aspects of who God is. So what do we do with a verse that says to work this out with fear and trembling? Because that doesn't sound very pleasant, if we're honest with ourselves. Now, I think our view of God, we often miss something. I think a lot of the times we aren't doing God justice in who he actually is. Now, there are unhealthy versions of fear where you understand God is just this big judgment machine that if you do one thing wrong, that he's just going to smite you where you stand or going to judge you for it and hate you for it. And that's kind of an unhealthy version of fear. I don't like that version, that there's no love in that. We have to understand that God is loving. So he's not just the big judgment machine where we have to be terrified of him all the time. But then also having no fear at all would also be unhealthy. Because the reason that would be unhealthy is we completely miss who God is if we don't have a healthy respect for who he is. Like, think about it for a second. The same God who created the universe that you live in, the same God who created life by breathing life into it, the same God who acted throughout the Old Testament in these miraculous ways and did these crazy things, the same God who became incarnate in Jesus Christ, walked around, knew people personally, performed miracles, the same God who chose to die for the sins of the world, the same God who was raised from the dead in the power of the resurrection, the same God who is all-present and all-knowing and all-powerful and can do anything, knows you very personally and wants to know you very personally. That is crazy. And I feel like we don't even think about it sometimes, if we're honest. I was thinking about that this week, and I was thinking, how often do I actually try to understand how big God is? I had a friend describe it to me once. He said, trying to understand how big God is is kind of like teaching an ant to play basketball. Like, at best, that ant is going to be vaguely aware of a giant orange bouncing thing in front of it, and that's probably as far as it'll get. God is so big and incredible. The magnitude is something that we can't understand. He is perfectly just and perfectly good, and we are so flawed that the fact that he would love us is nothing short of miraculous. But so often, we just want to put God in this box of thinking of him as, you know, just a, a friend that we talk to sometimes, or we kind of minimize our own understanding of God. We're missing who he is when we do that. 
This fear and trembling is not this fear that God is going to hate us. It's this fear of the God of the universe knows my name and knows everything I've ever done and wants to spend time with me. We miss how crazy that is, but in reality, that's the whole basis of our faith. That God, who didn't owe us anything, we could do nothing to earn love from him, decided that you and I were worth saving. He didn't decide to start over and just make new humans and move on. He didn't decide to just leave us to our sin and let us rot in it. He decided that you and I were worth something, and when you think about who God is, that is nuts. That fear and trembling is not a, a, a terrifying fear of being hurt. It's a healthy respect for who God is that we can't miss if we're going to call ourselves Christians. So Paul lays that out as the basis of faith and then call to action after that. So he lays it out that you are to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work within you. He is the one who initiated it. And what is the first thing he tells us to do in verse 14? Do everything without grumbling or arguing. I always thought it was kind of funny that that's how he starts that section, because it seems really trivial. Like when I think of the terms grumbling or arguing, I think of things like this video I saw earlier this week where a parent was keeping track of everything that their toddler threw a tantrum about throughout the week. Um, some things that the toddler was really upset about and wanted to scream and argue about were um, she couldn't hug the sun. <laughs> Makes sense. Uh, her hair was not green. She could not eat the table. The cat can't fly. And mom's name is not mom. Now, I don't want to trivialize the things that you and I grumble and argue about, because I don't think anybody here is throwing a tantrum over not being able to hug the sun. But if we have an accurate view of God, that I was just talking about, a real view of fear and trembling at the majesty of who God is and how much he loves us, a lot of the things that we spend our time grumbling and arguing about suddenly don't seem like they need that. Understanding God correctly should affect how you see every situation in your life. And so if we were all to just take a minute and think throughout our lives that the areas of our lives that we grumble and argue in the most, the areas where we are the most unhappy, the most frustrated, where we want to be up in arms against people, we want to argue against people. Where are you the most unhappy? Where do you grumble and argue? Now, insert into that situation that the God of the universe calls you his child and loves you and has called you to a greater purpose. That should radically change the way we look at those situations. Again, I don't want to trivialize them. Pain is real. And you should feel pain when it happens. But your understanding of it should be different than wanting to grumble and argue throughout your whole days being angry at the next person to the next person. Because keep in mind, Paul is in chains as he writes this. He was imprisoned for being a believer, for preaching the gospel. And he is telling us, don't grumble, don't argue. Have that healthy view of God. If Paul can do that from his chains, then I don't think we have an excuse to ignore the reality of who God is in every situation in our life and see what he might be calling us to in all of those situations. So from there, he then continues his call to action in verse 15. So that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life, and then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. So from this, Paul then calls us to be a witness to the rest of the world of who God is. 
to be children of God before a, w- a wicked and crooked generation. Now, there's an issue here that I also want to address that I have just decided to call the modern evangelical pressure issue. Anybody who's grown up in church before, you've probably heard things or had things taught to you that, while they're good and they're good intentioned, I think we kind of put a burden on ourselves without meaning to. You know, examples I've heard in the past of being a witness is, let's take every person in here, if they talked to two people and led them to Christ, and then those two people led two people to Christ, and then those two people led two people to Christ, eventually after a year, all of Chico is saved and we're a city on a hill. (laughs) Now, it all sounds fine, but we're putting this burden on ourselves of like, I need to go out and save the world. I'm an evangelical. I have to go evangelize. I have to do this. And it feels like that could be what Paul is saying. Now, again, that that point of view would make sense if it stopped at verse 16. So that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. Then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. If you stop there, that intense burden of needing to go out and be a witness to every single person you know would make sense. But Paul didn't stop there. He goes into joy from that place. He says, But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. Now, if we're honest, when we think about talking to people about our faith, when we think about evangelism, that scary word, there's a lot of burden that comes with that. There's a lot of pressure we put on ourselves. But the point that Paul is making here is that with a healthy view of who God is, a healthy view of how much we don't deserve his love but have received it anyway, what was once a burden becomes an incredible joy in being called his child and just called to live as his child. That is your witness. The world doesn't need to see a bunch of Christians who feel overburdened and are grumbling and arguing all the time and trying to Bible thump people into believing the same way we do. No, the, Bible, the world needs people who understand who God is and what a joy it is to be his child. That is is your witness. That is how you will shine among them like the stars in the sky. Your life as a believer, your spiritual health, your witness as a believer is entirely dependent on how you understand God. How you understand his love for you. He holds all of existence together and he also holds you together. He saved the world. He chose to save you very personally. He knows all things. He knows you very personally. He is all powerful, and he chose to use that power for you, on your behalf to save you. Follow the Father's call for the joy of being his child, not for the burden of of trying to do everything right and to do everything ourselves. Don't ignore him and put him into a Sunday box where we check into church on Sunday, do the right things, and move on. No, understand who this God is. It is crazy that that God would love us. What we're going to do next before we pray or anything, I'm actually going to ask each of you to close your eyes. And there's a few things that I want to say that I want us to spend some time reflecting on. Because I think that as believers, we don't spend enough time understanding these realities of God. So with everyone's eyes closed, the same God who created all things created you. In God's infinite wisdom, he decided you were worth it. In God's infinite love, his love does not run out for you.
God does not want to burden you, but to call you his child. God is perfect and loves you despite your imperfections. No one is greater than God and no love is greater than his love for you. The all-creating, immortal, all-knowing, eternal God calls you his child. Calls you to live as his child. To live into your purpose as his child. You guys can open your eyes. Now it would be easy to hear a message like this and move on from it of, okay, yeah, I got a picture of who God is this week and now I can move on from it. But I would rather instead challenge you to every situation you're in this week. Every situation in your life to see God in that, to see him accurately, as fully as you can, as big as he is, as involved as he is, as much as he loves you, to understand those things. Those pains that you have, the areas where you want to grumble or argue, the areas you feel unhappy or frustrated, those areas are the areas where you need to understand who God is and what he is calling you to in that. This passage that Paul writes in the middle of Philippians 2, in the middle of this letter to this church, it's brief, but it is such a clear picture of what it is to be a Christian. To understand that the living God, who we deserve nothing from, gives us everything, calls us his children, and says, now go show the world what it's like to be my child. That is incredible. And it is the purpose that you and I have been given for every situation in our life. I hope that you'll take that with you this week. I hope that that you'll let that sink in and you'll see how that can be at work in different areas of your life. I know for me personally, I struggle a lot to have a healthy understanding of that. When I'm struggling or making mistakes or sinning, I feel like God is that judgment machine just looking down on me, being disappointed with everything that I'm doing. And when things are going great, I kind of just have God in the corner of, like, you know, that's my friend that I'll talk to this week, and I'll go to church, and I'll, I'll do the church things, and things are good. I don't need to think about them too much. But to actually spend time each day reminding ourselves who God is gives us such a better understanding of the world around us. And suddenly those things that we want to grumble and argue about start to feel like those things that the toddler wants to grumble and argue about. Hair not being green or not being able to hug the sun. Things suddenly become much clearer when we understand who God is. Let's pray. God, we thank you this morning for who you are. Lord, that you would create everything that we know that you would hold existence together, that you would breathe life into each one of us, that you would be as big as you are, as incredible as you are, more than we could understand, and you would at the same time love us more than we could ever understand. I think about what we sang already this morning, that to know that you are love, and for that to be enough, Lord, let that be what our life looks like to see you so clearly that the rest of the world makes sense around us. To see you so clearly that living as your child is not a burden or a pain, but an incredible joy to know that we are known by the living God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand together for doxology. From whom all blessings flow 
praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Have a great week.